made it to the end. Here we are, last chapter of the semester, chapter 24. So this chapter is primarily going to be about bacteria. So it covers bacteria, archaea, and viruses. Um, but to be honest, we don't know nearly as much about archaea as we do about bacteria. And viruses are sort of an, uh, an add-in here. Um, they don't really fit uh, because viruses are not living organisms, but they do make organisms sick, uh, as some bacteria can as well. So they kind of get wedged in here at the end. But we're going to have this split into two parts. In the first half, I'll be talking mostly about bacteria and prokaryotic life. And then in the second half, uh, we'll switch over into viruses. So just to remind you, I, probably, I think I mentioned this in the very first chapter, there are three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Of course, we tend to be more familiar with the eukarya because we are eukaryotes, and all the multicellular organisms that we can see with our naked eye are eukaryotes. But the vast majority of life on Earth is prokaryotic in the form of either bacteria or archaea. And as I mentioned, we don't really know uh, nearly as much about archaea as we do about bacteria. We know they're prokaryotic. Uh, they tend to be considered extremophiles, meaning they're often found in extreme conditions, places where you find uh, you know, high temperature, unusual pHs, things like that. Um, but we do know a lot about bacteria, primarily because of our interest in, uh, in bacteria that can cause human disease. Uh, so that's really where this chapter is going to focus. And if you are a biology major, you're going to take microbiology down the road and you'll get uh, much more in depth on bacteria. So keep in mind, members of all three of these domains have certain basic requirements they have to meet in order to be considered living organisms. So pretty much all living cells can carry out uh, some form of glycolysis, right? Remember that was the... Um, production of ATP from glucose. They can have to be able to copy their genetic material, their DNA. They have to have some genetic material that can actually encode proteins or peptides, polypeptides. Um, and there's always going to be a plasma membrane surrounding every living cell. And there's always going to be ribosomes found uh, in every cell. Remember, ribosomes are the organelle that produce proteins. And also keep in mind there are some uh, very significant differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So remember, prokaryotic cells divide by this process called binary fission rather than mitosis. Um, prokaryotic cells usually have just a single circular chromosome rather than the multiple linear chromosomes that you find in eukaryotic cells. Uh, the DNA in prokaryotic cells is not found in a nucleus because prokaryotes lack all membrane-bound organelles, so no nucleus, no ER, no Golgi, no mitochondria, no uh, chloroplasts. And if we think of uh, these three domains of life uh, in an evolutionary sense, it's believed that one of the earliest evolutionary splits was the split that gave rise to bacteria and then archaea. So that's thought to be really the first significant evolutionary split. And then what's kind of interesting is the, the eukaryotes, ourselves included, are believed to have branched off uh, from the archaea uh, sometime uh, in the distant past. So I don't know, I find this particularly curious considering the fact that our eukaryotic cells actually contain organelles, and I'm referring to mitochondria and chloroplasts, uh, that were believed to have actually at one point been free-living bacteria. So you might remember that endosymbiotic theory. Um, there's lots of evidence suggesting mitochondria and chloroplasts were bacteria, free-living bacteria at one point. So it's kind of amazing considering we actually have, you know, bacteria or the remnants of bacteria inside our eukaryotic cells. We are still technically more closely related to archaea in an evolutionary sense. <clears throat> All right, so let's go through some, some of the very basics in terms of bacteria. So all bacteria are one of three shapes, 
spherical, round, or cockle bacteria, rod-shaped or bacillus, or spiral, sometimes called helical bacteria. And we know less about the shapes of archaea just because a lot of them have never been cultured. Um, a lot of the information we have about archaea just comes from DNA samples, so obviously you can't really tell the shape of an organism from its uh, DNA sample. And we also know for sure prokaryotes are the most successful organisms on Earth and are undoubtedly the first organisms on Earth. So we can find prokaryotic fossils like these stromalites. These are basically big, massive clusters of uh, bacterial cells that are dated back, you know, three and a half billion years. So uh, all the evidence suggests life on Earth began in the form of prokaryotic bacterial cells. And as I said, more successful than eukaryotes, just in terms of um, their sheer number. So um, I like to throw this fun fact out there. If you were to go outside and just scoop up a handful of dirt, there are more bacterial cells in that one handful of dirt than the number of humans who have ever lived on planet Earth. And think of how many handfuls of dirt there are out there, right? So we are way, way outnumbered by prokaryotic cells. And we find prokaryotes basically everywhere you look, any habitat, right? We already mentioned you find the archaea in these very extreme environments, but there are, there are bacteria or, and or archaea everywhere. And we're going to talk about viruses later. There's even more viruses out there than uh, bacteria. So in terms of basic structure, I know we've looked at some of this. Uh, pretty much all bacteria have a, a cell wall of some kind. It's different than the cell wall that we find in plants or uh, fungal cells in that it is composed of a different uh, carbohydrate called peptidoglycan instead of cellulose. So peptidoglycan is basically a polymer composed of amino sugars. Archaea do not have peptidoglycan, but they do have something similar that's called pseudopeptidoglycan. And some bacteria can actually have two uh, cell walls, and this kind of gets at this distinction between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So one of the very first lab tests a microbiologist would usually perform if they're studying a bacteria is the gram staining. So they'd want to know, okay, is this a gram positive or a gram negative bacteria? And uh, this is a, a basically a dual stain. And essentially, you will either get these dark purple gram positive bacteria or these bright pink gram negative bacteria. And this really all comes down to the structural difference in terms of the cell wall of these bacteria. So gram-positive bacteria have this very thick outer peptidoglycan cell wall layer on their, on their very exterior. And they will take up uh, basically both of these stains and become this dark purple color. So I think the cell wall is soaking up both of these stains. Whereas the gram-negative bacteria they do have a cell wall, but it's a thin layer, and it's sandwiched between an inner and an outer membrane. And so they're only able to take up one of the two stains, and uh, they become that lighter pink color instead. So if you, by, by performing the stain and knowing whether you're dealing with gram-positive or gram-negative, really what that's telling you is what is the cell wall structure like on this particular bacteria? Does this bacteria have the outer membrane or not? And that can be useful in a clinical sense because um, there are certain antibiotics that you might use to treat gram-positive bacteria, for example, that you wouldn't use to treat a gram-negative. So knowing, knowing what you're dealing with could be very important in a medical setting for sure. Um, yeah, so this is what I just mentioned. So for example, uh, antibiotic like penicillin interferes with uh, cell wall synthesis. So it will kill prokaryotic cells, but it's not going to affect eukaryotic cells, certainly not animal cells, because we don't produce a cell wall. We don't tend to think of bacteria as uh, moving around a lot, but most, I think it's fair to say, bacteria are motile, meaning they can move. 
some of the helical uh, spiral shaped bacteria can actually just corkscrew through whatever uh, media they happen to be growing in or liquid environment they happen to be in. There are some bacteria that can sort of glide or roll on whatever substrate they're growing on. Um, and there's even some more complex forms of movement like cyanobacteria, which are aquatic photosynthetic bacteria that you find in the ocean. Um, they can actually adjust the depth at which they're floating by either inflating or deflating these gas vesicles inside the bacterial cells. Um, so they could, you know, on a cloudy day, um, basically float a little bit closer to the surface to be able to get more uh, sunlight for their photosynthesis. Um, on a very hot sunny day, they might want to float a little bit deeper so they don't get fried by the sun, overheated. But by far the most common form of movement would be that driven by flagella. So remember, uh, many prokaryotic cells will have, uh, might have multiple flagella or at least one. Um, and this is just showing you a more detailed look at the structure of a flagella. I'm not going to go into it for our purposes here. Um, but just remember that is the sort of like sperm-like tail, right, that is going to use uh, the uh, shaping of microfilaments inside the flagella to get that whip-like motion that will propel a bacteria through a liquid media. I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide that prokaryotes reproduce asexually by binary fission. And just, I know we've looked at this before, but just to remind you that process, um, <clears throat> it is in essence really a simplified mitosis. So you have your single circular chromosome in the bacterial cell. It gets replicated, so it may be hard to see here, but you're producing an exact copy of that one circular chromosome. You now have two copies in the cell. Those are going to get pulled to opposite sides of the cell as the cell physically divides in half. And what we should end up with are two genetically identical copies. And this can happen uh, very quickly in some bacteria. So there have been some uh, bacterial species that under favorable conditions have been shown to be able to carry out binary fission division in 10 minutes, right? So that kind of goes to explaining, uh, you know, why there are so many bacteria on planet Earth, right? If you've got some bacteria that can basically double their population size every 10 minutes, of course, you're going to end up with a lot of those uh, cells. And then sort of on the flip side of that coin, you have bacteria living in sort of inhospitable environments that can basically go into just a suspended animation for apparently 100 years or more without dividing, basically just shut down metabolically and wait for conditions to improve. And one interesting version of that, that some bacteria can, uh, can produce these structures that are called endospores, where the bacteria will basically wall off its DNA, so it almost creates a little fortress inside the cell, kind of looks like a nucleus here. But you can kind of see these layers of uh, protective material, uh, in many cases cell wall material. Um, and again, this, this would be produced in response to some harsh environment, um, and it's, it's going to be fairly indestructible. So, you know, UV, heat, um, uh, high pH are, are not going to destroy a, an endospore. And after a, a very long period of time, perhaps indefinitely, we don't, we don't really know what the maximum uh, length of time an endospore can survive is, this could basically kick back into binary fission and uh, become metabolically active and start dividing again. We don't tend to think of bacteria, prokaryotic cells, as being big communicators, but uh, populations of bacteria do have some chemical communication and signaling that's called quorum sensing, which is typically used to try to monitor population size to make sure they're not running out of space and resources. Um, and there's an interesting phenomenon, bioluminescence, which you're probably familiar with, right? The ability per, to emit light uh, is actually tied in, in some ways, with this phenomenon of quorum, quorum sensing in certain bacterial species, like these Vibrio. Um, 
that you'll find in very large colonies, for example, in the Indian Ocean, and they can actually produce enough bioluminescence in some instances to be visible from space. Um, and these are also the kind of bacteria that will get ingested by fish and can develop these symbiotic relationships inside specific tissues in uh, marine animals where the bacteria is getting some nice protected place to, uh, to live and is presumably getting some nutrients from the fish. And the fish has this uh, now uh, like bioluminescent tissue, right? So it can use that to maybe attract uh, prey or a mate in some instances. And just to finish up this first part, I also wanted to, I wanted to end by pointing out that uh, prokaryotes are very, very metabolically diverse, so much more so than eukaryotic cells. So you have bacteria that are anaerobic or aerobic. They've got lots of different ways of making ATP. And just to give you a few examples, um, there's really these four nutritional categories, essentially four ways of powering cells. And we tend to be more familiar because of our uh, focus on eukaryotes in category one and category four here. So the photoautotrophs, this would be like plants that are using um, sunlight to perform photosynthesis, basically producing their own sugar, right, with uh, light energy. And there are bacteria like the cyanobacteria that can do this as well. Um, or we're pretty familiar with what we'd call chemoheterotrophs. So these would be organisms like ourselves that have to eat chemicals. Like we don't like to think of our food as being chemicals, but of course everything we eat is a mixture of chemicals um, to obtain energy, obtain those sugars that our cells are using to produce ATP. And there are bacteria that fall into that category as well. But then you also have bacteria in these two, uh, two middle categories here that you really don't find in the eukaryotic world. So you've got photoheterotrophs um, that are using light as an energy source, but they're getting their carbon from by ingesting other organisms, or what are called chemoautotrophs. So they're actually oxidizing inorganic compounds and using that energy to fix carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, you know, similar to what you would find in photosynthesis. Um, so yeah, these are, these are kind of interesting, unique categories. But the bottom line is prokaryotes are very, very nutritionally, metabolically diverse. All right, we'll stop there and pick this up in part two.